Okay, that's a very good moment for us to have a conversation. Um, in this century, uh, we got the taxi and we got a, a big news about the MTR yesterday, right? Who got a traffic jam yesterday? Most of us, right? Uh, we got taxi, our bus, and um, MTR. And, but in this generation, we got one more very known name called Uber. So thank you, Mr. Kenneth Sheet. This is your presenting time. Thanks for the great introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's, uh, it's my great pleasure to be here and talk about um, how we as a ride-sharing company actually enhances um, city transport, right? Um, I joined the company three years ago, uh, and back then in Hong Kong, there's no ride-sharing, there's no Uber, right? I, and uh, fortunate enough, uh, we've gained a huge public support and strong demand from people to use our service. And the service has been, the, the business has been doing very well in Hong Kong. But um, before I jump into autonomous car, uh, I want to take a chance and take a step back, actually, and let you think about what's the connection or relationship between autonomous car and ride sharing and Uber, right? Because essentially, is these are very, very different concepts, right? Uh, we jump into the space of autonomous vehicle, but we're not a car manufacturer. We are a platform uh, for people to book cars, right? We're a platform for drivers, for car owners who own a car to drive. Um, so when I say take a step back, I want to take a step back and show you how we see transport issues in cities and how Uber... Uh, a company that has established for seven years, cope with these issues, think of creative solutions to address these issues, and how we come a long way for, uh, uh, during these seven years to jump from car hailing, from ride sharing, from to carpooling, to now autonomous vehicle. And uh, this is Emily from Rene, our last speaker, that there are a lot of cool videos from Audi, Unfortunately, there, there isn't any cool videos from Uber on, on autonomous driving, but there is one that I put in the end of the presentation which I'd like to show you, but for now, uh, let me do most of the talking first, right? So what we recognize when, it's, when you take a step back and see issues is that there's just too many cars on the road, right? There are more than one billion private vehicles on the road. In the context of Hong Kong, there are more than half a million private vehicles on the road, right? And these could be good stuff, right? In the past years, people own vehicles because it's a, it, it actually ease um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the way where they go you know, from point A to point B, especially if you don't live near any public transport exits or if your neighborhood just you know, doesn't cover by public transport. But what we're seeing now is that too many cars actually would arise in a lot of social issues, issues that we, nobody, you know, want these to happen. And from a lot of reports, statistics, we can actually see that air pollution, the majority of air pollution actually comes with transport, comes with private cars. And these are stuff that cities need to deal with. And these are stuff that we, as a transport company, would like to find a way to work across. So what we're seeing here is that all these billions of cars running across the street are actually not utilized. Um, may I ask a question to the audience? How many of you own a car in Hong Kong? Can you raise your hand? Part of you, right? So, and for, for these people, how many of you actually drive your cars more than 10 times a week? Right? Less hands. So what we're seeing here is that actually in the context of Hong Kong, this number is even worse. A lot of cars are, are, are actually kept idle at car parks on the street, right? And we are just unfortunately using 5% of these assets where we, as, uh, as um, asset owners, are paying tons of money to maintain these cars, right? Parking costs, gas costs, car mortgages, you name it, right? But we are funding these assets which are unutilized, but unfortunately create a lot of social issues like air pollution, like you know, spending 
um, um, lots and lots of valuable space where we call parking lots in Hong Kong. And this is not a Hong Kong issue, this is a global issue that we are seeing. So when we launched our app seven years ago, none of us would ever thought of a chance where we are actually able to indirectly solve this transport issue, right? So when we launched Uber at uh, San Francisco seven years ago, we are an app which pulled all the idle limousines from hotels and travel agencies, put it on a platform for people who want a, a, a nice ride to order it. But the more we see, the more we recognize that in these limousines are not just the idle vehicles in the city. There are a lot more idle vehicles in the cities that we can utilize. And that's how we develop ourselves to be a ride-sharing company, right? To address this issue and to really link all these vehicles together and solve the issues that, that solve the issues that I just pointed out. And how we differentiate ourselves from a taxi company as a lot of you would know, is that we don't buy cars because there's no need for us to buy cars. There are already 95% of these cars which are left idle that we can use, that we can fully utilize to create more incremental benefits to the city. And what's more amazing when we launch our app and we operate in these cities is that when people are more willing to share their cars, more people are able to receive a more reliable ride, especially for people, as I said, you know, live in remote neighborhoods. In Southern California, for instance, you know, the, the more time we launch the app, the more people use and the more people share their car, the more reliable we are, right? And that's how we built up an organic business. And I will jump to a point later on where, where I'll explain why we get into autonomous vehicles. But, you know, the reason why we initially look at city transport issue is that we come from an angle of a transport provider, but not a car manufacturer. And this is a very, very important point, right? We aim to solve city transport issues and we find our solutions to work around these issues. And the second thing we realize, which I don't, uh, not, not a lot of people could see, is that we're a, we're a transport solution not to replace any of the existing transport options in the city. Taking London, uh, London as an example, Around 30% of Uber trips in London actually incur to and from um, subway stations in London, right? tube stations in London, right? In Hong Kong, that number skyrocketed to 33%, which means that you know, 10 out of, three out of 10 trips in Hong Kong by people like you Uber users actually use Uber, right? Um, to and from NPR stations. They actually use Uber as their last mile solution for them to, to, to take a public transit ride, right? Which is astonishing to us, right? In, in the past, people take taxi, but now they take Uber with an option that is easier for them to reach to a public transport or to for, or for us to actually complement public transport by easy ride sharing, right? And there are actually a lot of examples across the world which Uber, as a ride-sharing company, works with governments, work with cities in solving their unique transport pain points in their community, right? We're seeing, because of a lot of cars, because of a lot of resources that states are spending to build parking lots, governments are actually more willing to work with ride-sharing companies like us than spending money to build more parking lots because it's, that just doesn't make sense. Right? And to us, we think of solutions for these cities, right? We help cities to encourage car owners to, take, to put their cars on our platform. So our, our, our platform becomes more reliable to users. Users' waiting time for an Uber actually decreased over time. When I launched the, the Uber business in Hong Kong three years ago, our waiting time in Hong Kong was 15 minutes. Right? It's a fair waiting time, but it's not the best. For now, when we grew our driver base, when we successfully encourage a lot more drivers to share their car, our waiting time in Hong Kong dropped to five minutes or less, right? If you're in Central or in, or in the CBD of Hong Kong, the waiting time could actually go as low as three minutes, which is super comparable, uh, uh, compatible, right? So these are solutions which I would encourage you to think. Uh, coming from a transport platform provider standpoint, the, the reason why we're coming with you know, these innovative solutions, right, with the aim of solving people's need, with the aim of kind of transforming how people 
move across cities. And this is the most interesting part, right? We have a product called Uber Pool. It's a pool sir, it's a pool carpooling service that we launched in the US two years ago. And what we're seeing is that, you know, from from at the point when we are able to allow car owners to share their car with one passenger, now we're able to allow car owners to share with more passengers, right? We're able to pull people who are, you know, going from point A to point B, group people together and put it on the put them on the same vehicle. And what we're seeing here is that with all the Uber pool trips working at Bay Area at San Francisco, the traffic volume of Bay Area actually significantly decreased because people are pooling, because people are sharing rides, right? And what we're seeing in all the pool cities that we operate in the world in, is that we're actually saving the roads that could be used for more for, 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 for a lot of road users, you know, w which to our business is a great thing. Because we help cities reduce congestions. We also help cities reduce air pollution, right? And the next thing that I'm talking about is how we adapt into autonomous with the aim of further reduce these numbers, right? Reducing the number of miles that we can save and reduce air pollution. Um, this is probably a slide that Renee hates the most, but this is actually true, right? From, uh, from our research with uh, International Transport Forum, we're actually seeing people having less desire to buy a vehicle just because they find ride sharing so reliable, right? In China, we've run a similar survey with a third party research company, and this figure shoots up to 70%. 70% of people, car owners in China, would consider not to buy a car anymore because they find that it's actually more reliable, cheaper, and convenient to book a car on their app than driving a car themselves, right? And we're seeing similar figures from Morgan Stanley um, that, you know, uh, ride sharing, the whole business of ride sharing plus potentially autonomous vehicles would be the future, right? More than 20% of the business would be comprised of ride sharing. But so with auto autonomous vehicles, there are a lot of stuff that we can do but with ride sharing with a reliable platform that covers millions and billions of riders and drivers, there are a lot more that you can do. And this is a video that I'm gonna show, which is a experiment that we ran last year at Pittsburgh in the States, right? With our first autonomous vehicle, right? As I said, this is not as fancy as what we've seen for the Audi vehicles, but this is actually what we're doing and it's real. So at Pittsburgh, we have around 40 of these cars, uh, you know, when uh, uh, we put a driver in it, so there's actually a real driver, but the driver will only take control for emergency situations, right? And if you're a rider and you're lucky enough, during our trial period, if you're able to book an autonomous vehicle, your, that your Uber trip will be for free, right? So, you know, there are devices and stuff that we put on existing vehicles, right? We put a man there, uh, which only take control, uh, with emergencies, and the rest will be controlled by the vehicle, vehicle itself, right? And as a rider, you'll actually be able to see what happened during the autonomous ride on, 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 on the screen, at the back seat, right? So everything is transparent, and if you're, if you're not happy about that autonomous ride, uh, during that ride, you can actually ask that driver to take control, right? So we give, we give you a choice, you know? You, you either have a free ride, you know, uh, or you, you can have a normal Uber ride with a normal Uber car, right? So this is some experiments that are running in the US. We, I, I really hope that at some point, you know, we're able to um, mature that technology and at some point bring that technology to Asia and potentially Hong Kong. So as I said, you know, uh, self-driving cars and ride sharing goes hand in hand. We are seeing, you know, what we call se shared self-driving cars, right? This, and this is the exact aim that Uber wants to bring off to people because we're seeing this as a potential issue that every, uh, every one of us is seeing, you know, um, for, for vehicles that are dangerous, for, for, for potential accidents that we are able to avoid by employing um, self-driving vehicles. And there are actually more, much more that we can do. As a platform, um, not only can we in invest ourselves to these uh, self-driving vehicles, we're actually able to provide data to cities, right? So not only do we become a transport provider, we become a big data provider, 
right? A lot of people now talk about big data, so as governments, so as cities. But how can cities gather these big data and make meaningful projects and analysis, right? Um, Uber Movement is a platform we, that we just launched last month, which enables agencies, governments, regulators to look at data that we collect on our platform, right? And with autonomous vehicle, you know, they, 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 there's even a greater um, a, a way for us to collect more data and, and for, the, for governments to do more meaningful work with our data, right? And this is, this is now available for the US. It will soon be rolled out to other cities that we operate. Right. And the last one I want to make is that, you know, um, when, when, when at, at, at the beginning of the presentation, I encourage all of you to think of the relationship between autonomous driving and self and, and, and share vehicles because, um, you know, from a company's point of view, it's very different when we look at uh, autonomous vehicles. It's very different, not because we don't, we, 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 we are a platform. It's very different because we look at things from a perspective of how to solve city transport issues, right? When I come to Hong Kong and launch the business, the very, very first thing, right, that triggers me um, that there is a huge business case here is not because, you know, Hong Kong government supports autonomous vehicles, it's not about that, but it's about how people want options for point-to-point -point transportation, right? And how people deserve paying for an option for point-to-point -point transportation. And this is critically important because a lot of us live in a world where we're facing traditional transport options, which are, great, which are all great, but as consumers, you know, we deserve more. And as a company, we are pumped, excited, you know, to think of creative solutions like this, like ride sharing, like pooling, like potential uh, autonomous vehicles to solve solutions that we are seeing, that we're in the city and we're able to solve. So um, that's the end of my presentation. We'd like to um, answer more of your questions later on. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kenneth Shi. Uh, any questions we'd like to ask our representative? Yes, gentlemen. What will be Uber's perspective of business uh, whenever you switch to autonomous? Will you become an automaker? Or who will own the cars? Yeah, thanks for your question. So um, it's, I was, so, so Uber, Uber actually invested in uh, a lab, which we now own, uh, in um, dealing with autonomous vehicles. So we do um, have people who work on these, but for now we're still, um, I would say, uh, working with existing manufacturers in doing this stuff. So a lot of cars that you see on the video are actually um, technologies that we co-invest with, um, you know, a third party to do this. But on the, in the long run, that could be a solution. I think that's, that, that, that could totally po be possible. But would us be the, the vehicle owner, there are, there, are, there are apparently a lot of options that we can, we can play around with this, right? Um, I, think the, I think what we're trying to head to, it's a future where we're, we're, we're seeing as you know, beneficial t ultimately to road users and to, trans uh, and to customers. Um, and I, I mean, th th as you said, right, um, we can totally be, th there's, there's a total possibility, possibility for us to manufacture our own cars, but then there, there, there may also be a possibility where we partner with exis existing OEM companies. Thank you, Mr. Kenneth Shi. And any questions to ask our representative? Yes, gentlemen. Yeah, um, you had a couple of slides that were particularly interesting in terms of the impact on OEMs, like speaking that given that Renee is here as well. And I think my question is to both of you. I mean, up to now, there's this idea of buying your own vehicle as a status symbol, a status symbol or an expression of who you are, your personality. And that's hugely benefited Audi and the other luxury makers, especially in China or other, uh, other countries where the wealth is, uh, is, you know, is um, expanding. So, but it, it seems pretty obvious that in 10 or 20 years with the younger generation, that whole mindset is gonna change drastically. So, Aside from everything else that's going on, my question to the OEMs, to Renee, is, you know, how are, you, how are, how are any of these OEMs 
going to um, survive or prosper in the future. I mean, certainly there's going to be a lot of losers in this transition. Maybe Rene, it's, it's best to answer that question, but unfortunately, it seems like he, he's left. <laughs> so I, I, I'll try to answer um, uh, the other side of it. Um, I think that's, that's totally true. Um, even without um, autonomous driving in place, um, this has been a question where we ask ourselves a lot of time, right? Uh, when we're able to successfully transform people's habit from owning a car to sharing a car is a big thing, right? And it's a big thing not only to our business model, but it's a big thing to a lot of existing sh stakeholders like OEM companies, right? Car manufacturers. And what we're seeing here, or what you know, personally I'm seeing here, is that things are going to change. But it doesn't mean that we will be completely replacing the need of owning a car. There will be people who, who need a car, but as I said, there will be, there will, there will be other ways for people to get across cities, right? Um, and uh, in the case of Uber, at least for now, we're still working very closely with car manufacturing companies, right? At the same time, we see, we're see we seeing the number of cars decrease, but at the same time, we also want drivers to buy a car and share their vehicles out with other people. So, it, I mean, to, to, to vehicle manufacturers, that this may be a, re a right time for them to think of, you know, what they will be heading to in the next five to ten years. We're seeing millennials, um, um, like, you know, what I've just shared, you know, in ten years or twenty years later, no one or very, very few people may own a driving license because there isn't a need, right? So, but w would that mean that, you know, there'll be no cars on the road? Probably not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kenishi. Please take a seat. Thank you, thank you for fantastic presentation. <laughs>